All right then. Okay. <clears throat> Welcome and good evening, everybody, to our second online lecture of this season's lecture series. Um, I'll hand over to Graham in a minute to introduce the introduce Ema. Um, but before that, that, we don't actually really have any any announcements to make, other than a few weeks back we had uh, the Geologists Association conference for which uh, the the Edinburgh Geological Society supported, and all the all the talks were recorded. Now I think it'd be worthwhile uh, making all the members get get access to them. So as soon as we can find the links, I just had a quick look. Now they're not there at the moment, but well, there'll be plenty more lectures and some really interesting talks in covering things as diverse as um, who was the king who was from Leicester. So Richard the third, Richard uh, the third, yeah, Richard the third, uh, amongst other things. So, uh, well, uh, we'll get an email sent out with the latest those when we find it. Other than that, our next lecture is in two weeks. But before, or rather than jumping ahead, let's I can hand over to Graham now and to introduce Ema for tonight's lecture on critical raw materials for the energy transition. Yeah, thanks, Tom. Um, welcome, everyone. Um, I, I said at the, um, the previous lecture that um, I tried, certainly in the autumn term, to make the, um, the lecture program um, with the, the help of the speakers, uh, to make the lecture program for this part of our session kind of reflect what was going on over in Glasgow with COP26 and so on. Um, so we weren't trying to steal their thunder or anything, but Ema may try, I guess. Um, but I, I wanted to sort of delve into some of the, uh, the themes that might be at least relevant to uh, people's thinking at, at this time of year. So it gives me, uh, I'm very pleased that uh, Ema, um, Ema Didi is going to speak to us tonight. Ema is a, an economic geologist with uh, BGS, and uh, I've, but uh, a graduate, uh, I think I'm right in saying, of, of Edinburgh. In, I'm looking at my other screen here, yeah. um, <laughs> graduate in 2010 from the University of Edinburgh, but then went to uh, Camborne to the School of Mines to do uh, a, a, a mining geology MSc. So that's very mm -hmm. much her, her background uh, uh, and that's where her training has come from. Uh, Emma joined uh, BGS in 2013, was 13, that? Yeah, nearly yeah. nine years. So I uh, had her feet under the desk for quite a wee while now. Uh, but in all of that time, being involved in, um, well, aspects of economic geology, uh, and particularly in terms of critical minerals, supply chains, uh, and um, where, in a sense, where the world is going in this day and age with um, uh, alternative energy sources, critical metal supplies, battery development, and so on. So. It's um, Ema is involved in, in in certainly one of the uh, the main planks of BGS commitment to uh, the themes that are being and the ideas that are being explored in uh, COP26 over this coming ten days. So um, I, I'm delighted that Ema is able to to come and talk to us this evening on critical raw materials for the energy transition. So Ema, simply hand over to you. And um, at the end, uh, everyone, as usual, if uh, you want to raise your hand for questions or put your uh, question <coughs> into the chat box, we, we'll, um, by one means or another, get around to letting you uh, ask Ema any questions that you might have at the end. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you very much, Graham, And thank you very much for the invitation as well. Um, to talk, and I'm always delighted to, to talk to new groups of people. So um, this is, uh, I'm, I'm really pleased with that. Um, so I'll, I'll jump straight in. Um, I'm gonna talk to you as Graham said about um, critical raw materials for the energy transition. Now this is absolutely not the work of any one person. Um, this is done particularly with um, a lot of members of the BGS DRM, which is decarbonization and resource management. So that team of people, but particularly, I'd like to thank Catherine Goodenough, um, Alicia Lachinska, Rich Shaw at BGS, and then a host of other people um, from lots of other institutions and lots of other countries around um, the world who we've been working with on this. As Graham said, I've kind of been in, involved with this kind of eight, eight plus years now. So 
I'd also like to note that we have um, been funded by um, a, sorry, my thing was blocking it, uh, been funded by um, a range of projects over the past 10 years. And these are EU Rare and High Tech Alcarb, which are Horizon 2020 projects, and then SOS Rare, which is funded by NERC and LIFT, which is funded by UKRI. So we have a range of, of people who've been working with us on this for a long time now. So first of all, I want to kind of demystify this title, I guess. So what are critical raw materials? And it's really quite simple. It's those raw materials that are both of economic importance and have a risk to supply. Now, what's economically important to the UK isn't necessarily economically important to Japan or Australia. So that is obviously a, a it's it's of a it's a very personal thing. What is economic importance to your country? But the risk to supply is a bit more challenging. Um, if you're 100% dependent on imports of raw materials, then any interruptions to that supply um, or any risk of interruption to that supply, it does make it very critical. And so that is fine if you're a country like China who produces lots of different materials, um, you're not at such risk of supply interruption. Or if you're like the UK, who is almost 100% dependent on imports, then yes, you are very concerned about your supply and ensuring it's secure. Now, Simandel et al. in 21 did this very nice graphic, which might be a bit much, but it gives you a real idea. So if you just look at the yellow base there with the critical raw materials, it has them all there arranged. And actually, you can lay upon this different applications. So you can see that, so for example, nickel, lithium, cobalt, canadium, graphite, and manganese are all important for the um, battery raw materials. But then rare earth and cobalt are important for magnets. So um, it really just depends on your application. And so for example, if you're a big battery manufacturer, these are your critical raw materials. You're not necessarily so worried about all the rest. So it really depends on your economy and what you're interested in. Um, the other thing I'd like to mention then is the copper, zinc, and silver. Now these aren't listed as critical raw materials, but in terms of the energy transition, in terms of um, general construction and infrastructure for electricity, these are really very important. So what is the energy transition? Essentially, it's um, uh, essentially the energy transition is converting our, our um, it's decarbonizing our sources of energy and our transport. So right now, atmospheric CO2 is today, this is today's data is 414.9 parts per million. Now that's gone up about 60 parts per million in my lifetime. And this uh, increase in CO2 in the atmosphere is contributing to global temperature rise. Now, in order to stop that rise, getting greater than 1.5 degrees C, which was discussed at COP25 in Paris, CO2 emissions must hit net zero. And now this graph shows a loads of different pathways. I'm not gonna go through it at all, but all of them in order to to um, hit that, to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees, all of them hit zero, you can see the zero here, all of them are hitting net zero in 2050. So this is why we need to decarbonize our energy and our transport. Now, one of the ways in which we can do that is um, in terms of our fossil fuel consumption in vehicles. So the way um, the UK government is hoping to push this agenda is to end the sale of new petrol and diesel vehicles by 2030. They've released quite a few strategies and plans in the last couple of years, which um, really have a, a very green focus and are looking to really do uh, to really change how we how we transport ourselves and how and the energy we use. So they're quite ambitious plans. And if you just look at these graphs here, uh, just if you just look at the blue, these are these are the sales of. Uh, electric vehicles or um, passenger light duty vehicles as they're listed up here. And you can see that they've increased um, tenfold since 2010. So just in a decade, we're already seeing enormous increases in um, car purchases. And then you can see that China really is leading the way in this. It's huge and um, huge market for electric vehicles in China and in Europe as well. There's, it, you can definitely see how it's been increasing everywhere basically around the world. So this is a real thing, it's a real trend and it is happening. Now, if we look at energy consumption, <clears throat> excuse me, in, in 2020 in the UK, just here in this box, fossil fuel um, provided energy for electricity for 41% for of the electrical needs in 2020. 
Nuclear energy provided 17% and renewables provided 42%. Now, this is the British electricity mix at seven o'clock this morning. So this is show this was a bit different to the average for 2020. It was almost 60% uh, fossil fuels, which was quite high. Um, it was up 16% nuclear, so that's fairly stable, and but then only around 20% for our renewable energy. So you can see that there is there's quite a big um, use of fossil fuels still ongoing in, in the UK economy. Now, one of the things that's important as well to remember is that as we move away from fossil fuels, our projected nuclear capacity um, with the retiring of quite a few different um, quite a few different uh, sorry power plants, um, all starting with H for some reason. Um, um, basically, as they retire, but Hinkley Point C, if it happens and all goes ahead, will bring us back up, but not as high as we are. We'll still be 10 gigawatt capacity lower. So we will expect reduced nuclear uh, in nuclear use for our electricity consumption going forward. So how we fill that gap, we, we're reducing our fossil fuels, our nuclear is going to reduce, so we will have to increase our renewable energy. And so that is one way that we can reduce our carbon emissions, can it be reduced to zero? And with renewable energy, it, at least there's a potential of working towards that. So as I said, you can convert fossil fuel powered energy to renewable sources. And here we've got pictures of photovoltaics or solar panels, as they're also known. This is an onshore wind farm, but there's also very large offshore wind farms, particularly around the coast in Scotland and the North Sea. We, this geothermal is also another way of doing this. Now, this is a very nascent technology in the UK. You might have heard um, discussions of um, heat from mine wastewater in underground in uh, flooded old underground mines, and that's a possibility. There's, uh, this particular one is for hotter geothermal, so what like what's being drilled for in Cornwall. Um, there is the potential to increase our nuclear capacity, as there is actually no CO2 emission at the actual generation. Stage, um, there's no CO2 is emitted in these particular in, in nuclear power plants. The other thing that we can do is swap our fossil fuels for biofuels. You might have, if you're on if you're on the motorway, you might have seen the McDonald's trucks, which on the side say, yeah, you know, this this truck is powered by our old chip oil, so it's all powered by bio, biofuels. And so there's definitely those technologies existing at the moment. The other alternative fuel is hydrogen, and this is what actually we think might be quite a disruptive, they call it a disruptive technology, and will actually overtake things like electric vehicles, but that's just predicted at the moment. But how you generate your hydrogen, so the electricity that you use to actually um, for the electrolysis of water to create hydrogen, if you're burning fossil fuels to do that, then it's absolutely not green. So that needs to be done with renewable energy at the source. The other way we can um, manage our CO2 emissions is with carbon capture utilization and storage. Now, I'm not, I'm not going to be talking about this. This isn't really my area of expertise, but I can answer questions on it if we have them later. And then if we talk about transport, how we can really reduce it. Again, um, we can swap our fossil fuels for biofuels and hydrogen. And as I said, you have to make sure you're sourcing the energy for your electrolysis to, to make your hydrogen. It has to be from renewable sources. But then we also have electric powered vehicles. Now you're probably seeing Teslas and various types of electric vehicles um, on the roads uh, around Edinburgh, or around Scotland. Um, but also there are buses that are now being um, driven or powered by electric power. Um, this is a picture of a Flixbox, Flixbus in Germany, which has recently just started um, running. The other thing you can do is for these larger vehicles, so bin trucks and lorries, it's that hydrogen is absolutely going to be where it goes. Realistically speaking, the size of the battery you would have to carry around on one of those trucks would just be so enormous and would take so much charge. It's just really not very practical. And so hydrogen really will be the way they do it. And actually in Glasgow, they've just purchased or are awaiting 19 hydrogen powered bin trucks. So these have no CO2 emissions at the exhaust. The only waste really is water. And so this, these are really, um, excellent and clean approach to um, decarbonizing our transport or our vehicles. So why am I talking about all this? Why, why do I keep mentioning all these various um, uh, uh, technologies and, and uh, you know, moving away from fossil fuels? It's because, and I'm quoting this, ambitious climate action will bring significant demand for minerals. 
because clean energy technologies need more materials than fossil fuel based electricity generation technology. And that's it. Um, if you want to have more batteries, if you want to have hydrogen powered vehicles, if you want to have photovoltaics, if you want to have wind power, wind, wind turbines, sorry, um, you will need more minerals. Now, this is a really excellent report. So it's called Minerals for Climate Action. And that's where this quote comes from. And it was a World Bank report um, in 2020. And they were doing projections for the amount of minerals we would need to use in order to actually reach net zero, which sounds like an oxymoron, but, but it is. And at a minimum, at a minimum here, so here in 2020, if you follow this lower green line, an absolute minimum, we're going to have to double the amount of um, minerals that we produce in order to address this in, in a um, sustainable manner. So like I said, we, we can't tackle climate change without adequate supply of raw materials in order to actually manufacture these clean technologies. And this is just quite a nice little graphic that shows, you know, in the 1700s, we had very, um, you know, it was, it was windmills and water mills powering things and, um, or, or, or not even powering things, but, you know, <laughs> creating various sorts of energy for grinding and for milling and things like that. And we only use a handful of different commodities. Whereas now in, you know, in the, in the noughties in the 21st century, we're using almost everything on the, <laughs> bar, bar the very radioactive things, we use almost everything on the periodic table. And that's why we, you know, in order to develop all these technologies, we have to utilize the, the metals that we have in the world and um, make best use of them. And now we're using hundreds or tens of elements at this point. And so when I talk about these elements and what we're using, this, this is what we're looking at. So the, the big things that I'm going to talk about today are, are um, magnets and batteries. Um, I can talk about all the other stuff in, in the questions if people have questions. So in, in, in electric vehicles, in the motor, there's something called a permanent magnet. Now, these are quite large and they're um, to ensure the drive, the drive chain of the car keeps going. Now, these permanent magnets are very, very powerful. So they, and they contain metals um, that are known as rare earth elements. So most magnets contain neodymium or ND, as I'll refer to it um, throughout the thing. Uh, throughout the presentation. And while there are just large permanent magnets in the car, there's also quite a lot of small magnets in your car where you wouldn't even realize there were. And these all use rare earth elements. Now, these magnets are scaled up to um, kind of between seven and 10 kilo size magnets. They're really very large. And that's what's in the wind turbines. That's what's driving the motor in the wind turbine. So we're using these magnets in two very, very common technologies, our electric vehicles, and our wind turbines already. Now in batteries, we have a range of metals, which I won't go through here, but I'll talk about after. And then for our hydrogen um, production, the actual fuel cells um, are made using platinum group metals and graphite. And in solar panels, we've got a range of what we call very minor metals, which are usually byproducts of other things. So gallium and indium, byproducts of um, zinc processing. Um, and those are all essential for solar panels. And those are really important, maybe less so in Scotland, although quite a lot of the new builds, for example, have solar panels. But in terms of these big solar farms, um, which are happening in America and in lots of places around the world, these metals are in high demand. And then we have these cross-cutting metals, as I said. So copper, if you want to transport all this electricity and create grids and new infrastructure, you, you, copper is essential. And even in the cars themselves, the electric vehicles have three times more metal in them than a normal car. So just even to construct these cars, we're going to need, we're talking about enormous amounts of raw materials. Just on the electric vehicles, just specifically, the, um, the IEA, which is the International Energy Agency, reported that the demand for metals in 2040, specific to batteries, can be up to 40 times for lithium. So here, so this blue is lithium and nickel, you're looking at all, over 40 times the amount of lithium today will be needed in 2040 to meet the demand. And then for the rest of them, you're kind of looking at between 15 and 30 and 25 times the amount of metal. So we're going to have to significantly increase the amount of metal that we're producing now to meet this demand. And so it kind of begs the question, will there be enough raw materials? Now, this, I have to admit, this question kind of frustrates me a little bit. 
And when we see things like natural sources of six of these are set to run out within the next 100 years, that's just not true. Um, the, the Earth is obviously finite, but the, to suggest that we're running out of things is, is really quite um, incorrect and it's in misinformation, really. You see resource and reserve figures being misunderstood and misused, suggesting that we're going to run out of raw materials. But in, in a mining context, resources and reserves have really specific economic meaning. And that's um, the reserves are the part of the mine that you actually are extracting. So it's a really dynamic, um, a really dynamic figure. It's just the inventory of what can be mined at the moment, not really a limit to how much, um, if you count up all the reserves, that's all there is. That's absolutely not true. Realistically, the major issues are the economic issues, the environmental issues, and the social issues. So what we call a social license to operate, that your the, the people where you are going to locate this mine agree to it and are willing, and the government is willing for you to run it. And so really, I would, you know, scarcity really isn't the issue. But there are some interesting questions about it, though. If you look at these, so can metal supply keep up with electric vehicle demand? That's quite a different question. And one I saw today, um, a quote from a Black Mountain, Black Mountain CEO, Black Mountain is just a, a company in America, that the mining sector is wildly unprepared for the energy transition. And that was that's quite a statement. But I'd like to, to dig around that a bit more. And I think rather than worrying about whether there's enough metal, it's we need to think about whether we have a reliable supply of minerals, going back to that supply risk again that I mentioned at the beginning. So on average, it takes 16 years to actually develop your mine. So from going in from first discovery to actual first pour, and that's gonna depend on what the mineral is, the location, what the mine type is. You can spend more than 12 years on average completing exploration and feasibility studies. And that's rounds of money raising and drilling and analysis and planning before you even get to the point of saying, you know, we absolutely are going to open this mine. And then you have four to five years for construction. You've got to think of all the infrastructure that's around a mine, the processing plant, all the electrical infrastructure that goes in, all the facilities for the staff that are going to work there. It's a huge, huge process. And so these long, really long lead in times, that's where the questions about being unprepared for the energy transition come in. So can the mining sector really um, um, react to, to ramp up the output if demand were to pick up rapidly? And that's not a question I'm, I'm able to answer, um, but I suspect based on this, you know, based on how long it really does take to get a mine to get started, it could be quite hard. And of course we have recycling, and absolutely this is a, a very, very important part of the supply chain. But the analysis done again by the IEA suggests that actually, even if we are very good at recycling our, this is for batteries, lithium ion batteries, re, you know, recycling them and reusing them for second lives, various storage opportunities that can happen there, you're still only going to reduce the supply requirements by about 10%. So that is a significant amount of primary raw materials that will still be needed to meet those demands that we're talking about for 2040. So I promise, onto the geology, where are we going to get these raw materials? So raw materials, um, or these critical raw materials, of specifically energy transition raw materials, are associated with a wide, wide range of deposit types. So I won't go through all of these, but generally you get low temperature deposits formed at the surface. So you get cobalt nickel laterites or rare earth laterites, or your lithium that sits in brines on the surface, particularly in South America. Or you can get plasters of things, um, particularly rare earth elements, as an example. On the seafloor, there's been an awful lot of research looking at nodules and crusts, which have manganese and nickel and cobalt. And then you can have your high temperature deposits, so your igneous and your metamorphic deposits. Now, these can be carbonatites, which are a source of rare earths, and alkaline igneous rocks, also a source of rare earths. You can have your pegmatites that form, for, uh, that form um, which are your hosts of lithium, you can have enrichment in your sediments, and you can have things, large igneous intrusions, like layered intrusions, where you have nickel and cobalt associated with your magmatic layer. And so this, there's a huge, huge range of deposit types that, well, partly that me and my colleagues work on, um, but also that people are working on all around the world to try and understand where we're going to get these raw materials from. And now, like I said, I'm going to, so I'm going to talk quite a bit about um, these um, sorry, electric vehicles, and particularly about the rare earth 
and lithium and a couple of the other metals that are associated in the batteries. So just an overview of the, the various different types of the rare earth elements. I'm happy to answer questions over going into huge amounts of details here. But basically, most of the rare earths that are processed now come from alkaline igneous rock and carbonatite. Now, there are also examples of veins and scarns and IOCG or, sorry, uh, iron, yeah, iron oxide, IOC, not IOCG, iron oxide, iron, iron, iron oxide appetite deposits, sorry. Um, so, um, which are uh, quite a lot of these are in China. And there's some, this picture here is from the Kola Peninsula in Russia. And then you also have um, deposits formed by erosion and weathering. So these can be your placers, your laterites and iron absorption caves, which is what the Chinese production is from, iron absorption caves. And then some of the work I've done myself is looking at rare earths as a product of aluminium production, so from bauxite, and um, rare earths as a byproduct of phosphorus from phosphorite. So there's lots of sources, although we right now produce most of our stuff from carbonatite, alkaline igneous rocks, and iron absorption caves, there are lots of different sources for rare earths. The main issue with rare earths is that we can actually only really process five of the minerals that they're hosted in, and we only have the technology for that, although lots of people are researching processing tech. Um, but the, um, the rare earths themselves are rare, are not at all rare, and it was a terrible name that was, was given to them in the first place, very misleading. So this is just an example of a map um, that actually I prepared um, a couple of months ago, looking at the distribution of rare earth deposits in the smaller circles and mines in the bigger circles. So you can see a, a density of them in China, and then that one up in the Kola Peninsula, as I mentioned, there's one in, in um, America, Mountain Pass, Arashar in Brazil, and then um, in Madagascar, there's some heavy mineral sands, and there's also Katara in uh, Burundi. And then there's one uh, called Mount Wells in Australia. So there's, there's a few deposits, a few working deposits, but realistically, um, not very many mines for what is a very what are very in demand uh, metals. So if we just look, so this is some of the work I was mentioning about statistical work. We produce these world mineral production um, books every year, and the data for 2019 is now up, and it shows that China produced 71% of all the rare earth oxides. And when you think about when you're concerned about your security of supply, that dominance of China for both production and also processing and magnet production. That's when you start worrying about um, when you are dependent on imports. There's also been quite a lot of press you may have seen on the negative environmental effect of extracting those rare earths, particularly in China. Um, now, this has absolutely been cracked down on, and there have been some, some um, changes made in terms of environmental regulation in China, but it's still um, a bit risky um, the, that those will be adhered to. Um, and so that the, the environmental consequences of, of extracting these metals are something that people are quite concerned about. And then um, within each deposit, so the rare earths come kind of as a package. And so you'll have some deposits that are high in one type and lower in kind of some of the higher in like what we call the light rare earth elements and lower in the heavier or, or vice versa, depending on the formation conditions. But the thing is, when you extract it, you get all the metals. Some of them will be higher and, you, and some of them will be more valuable. So, for example, I mentioned the adymium, which is used in these permanent magnets, has a much higher value than something like cerium, which is quite ubiquitous and often is in quite high, quite high amounts in these deposits, but it is very low value. And so you end up in, um, you end up maybe with stockpiles of cerium or cerium or almost being a waste material when you're just trying to get out one element. And so that, that balance problem across these deposits can be quite problematic specifically for the rare earth. And of course, then there is the recycling of rare earth from these permanent magnets. So actually the University of Birmingham is building the first recycling plant for high performance rare earth magnets. So these quite, um, the ones that are in your cars, the ones that are in the wind turbines, the ones that are in hard drives, so quite very powerful magnets. That they have developed a process here whereby they can um, essentially powderize the magnet and collect this back to reform new magnets, to remelt it into new magnets. And that's all fine if you consider the size of a hard drive. I don't, I don't have a scale on this particular picture. There wasn't a scale, but you're kind of talking a couple of centimeters here. 
and that's fine for um, working on those sort of things. But when you consider a wind turbine, and I mentioned before that some of the magnets could be seven kilos, 10 kilos, it really becomes quite challenging to, to collect those because without wanting to uh, stress anyone out, if you imagine you've got two very powerful magnets and someone's put one here and someone's put one here, they're gonna be very attracted to each other and you, the, there's a real health and safety risk in terms of people getting injured by these magnets. It's genuinely a problem. And then the other, um, the other kind of quite big challenge is that we don't have a process for collecting these yet. The government hasn't really set up any um, kind of processes or, or centralized any of this collection, although some places, so some garages, Tesla, for example, will take back your battery, but that still poses a problem. And then you have the disassembly. So one of the things about um, permanent magnets in cars is that what you don't want them to do is rattle. Everything needs to be completely uh, secure. Um, and how they manage that is by adding super glue. And super glue, as you know, is incredibly diff difficult material to break down. So the disassembly, even if you you know you put your car up on on your high uh, high platform, you know you've taken the battery out. That takes quite a few people. It's it's very labour intense. And then once you get the battery out. The things are glued together. There's um, not all batteries are the same shape, not the same size. You don't know exactly the configuration once you open it. Um, and then they're stuck together. So that disassembly is a huge challenge to the recycling of rare earths at the moment. And as I mentioned before, the health and safety issues with working with very high power magnets, are, it's, it's a real, it is genuinely um, a, a big consideration, making sure that that's safe and people are able to do it safely. So I'm um, continuing on about the, I've kind of talked there about magnets and about the rare earths. And now I'm going to talk about the batteries. Um, so within your battery, you have lithium, a variety of different metals, but you will always have lithium and you will always have graphite. And then you'll have a combination of cobalt, nickel, manganese, and vanadium. And if we look at a battery, so as I said, you always have graphite and that's where your anode is. And so you have a graphite anode. But then your cathode can have lots of different, um, com different formations, different combinations of metals. So you can have uh, nickel, manganese, cobalt at the moment is the dominated one, but is the, sorry, is the dominant type of cathode that's being used in these batteries, but that will change and it absolutely has changed even in the last five years. Um, so it's a very evolving tech. People are forever trying to make them more efficient, hold their charge for longer, um, make them lighter even. So there's lots and lots of research ongoing, but at the moment, um, they are definitely the most dominant type of battery for electric vehicles. And so if we think about where we can actually get our lithium from, so typically they're from hard rock deposits or brine deposits. And production is, I think, kind of split, kind of 60, 40 in terms of brine versus hard rock. So the Lithium rich pegmatites, they're formed by melting of metasedimentary rocks at depth. And these are a major source of um, the mineral spodumene, which is the source that the, um, the uh, pyro uh, lithium pyroxene is used for as a source for lithium. And these can be enormous, they can be up to 100 meters thick, but they can extend laterally for kilometers. And Greenbush's pegmatite in Australia is, is one of the main sources for lithium rich pegmatite. Um, you can also have a situation where you, lithium rich fluids have flowed through basins and so you can get deposits of lithium rich clays or borates forming and there's a big lithium deposit in Serbia that's currently that Rio Tinto are looking at exploiting but that is currently um, struggling to get the social social license to operate at the moment if you're following that in the news so that will be really interesting to see what happens there and then a large proportion of um, excuse me, current lithium supply comes from these lithium rich brines, which occur in salars or which are salt lakes. And these occur high in the Andes. Um, these, um, you can see the picture here, um, they, 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 they take up um, quite large swathes of land and they're also quite susceptible to uh, increased rainfall, decreased rainfall, um, and also uh, water use of the local communities. Um, there's been some, some ch clashes between lithium producers and the local community. So again, that social license to operate being very important there. There's also been work in the UK. There is um, potential to extract lithium from geothermal brines, which are circulating underground. And that's what Cornish Lithium have been investigating um, uh, in 
in, in Cornwall. And this is a map that my colleague uh, Rich Shaw prepared, and this is of the global lithium mines. So you can see this high density of deposits and mines down here in South America. And what you can see, again, there's a couple of dots around the rest of the world, but um, China really does have a large, large portion of the market for lithium in terms of production. Um, so uh, again, going back to these mineral statistics, it's not a straightforward calculating who is producing the most lithium minerals, but the um, South American countries are um, massive producers of uh, lithium. And, but the, uh, the real issue with lithium is, is less so the distribution of all the mines, but the chemical production of lithium occurs in a few regions and China produces 60% of it. So the people shipping their ore, um, their lithium ore to China in order for it to be produced into the various uh, lithium chemicals. And you also have to have what they call battery grade lithium. So ensuring that your lithium product is as high enough quality. There's lots of lithium deposits, but in order for them to be battery quality, um, you know, there's, there's only a few deposits or there are fewer deposits that are of that level and it requires that processing to bring it up. Um, the other thing that has been quite problematic is that the lithium price has actually been very depressed. Now, lithium isn't sold on the open market. It's all done through private enterprises and um, MOUs with countries or with companies. And so the, that kind of has artificially depressed the lithium price, but that has changed, well, the, the process hasn't changed, but the value of lithium has increased exponentially in the last three or four years because of the, the increased demand for these lithium ion batteries. And I mentioned before that the mines in South America are um, exposed and, and Australia, they're exposed to high levels of climate and water stress. So that and thinking about climate change and all we're doing to try and ameliorate it. But actually, these, these particular mines are at real risk from actual um, the, the actual, actual climate change in their areas. So you've got to think about the impacts of climate change on mining as well, um, which is a really interesting thing to, to consider in terms of the whole picture. Now, if I've mentioned there, and you might have seen on the previous map, that um, there seems to be quite a fairly big distribution of deposits kind of across the world, but maybe not so many in Africa and certainly only one producing. Um, but there, there are actually extensive lithium resources and so many of them are now in this pre-feasibility and definitive feasibility stage. So towards that end of that 16, 12 to 16 years that um, I was mentioning in terms of getting um, mines to production. So hopefully there will be a real suite of mines coming on, on stream and production coming on stream in the next kind of five to 10 years coming out of Africa. And if, if you are interested in that, we, we have just produced a lithium resources um, brochure for, for Africa, um, which outlines all those deposits and information quite well. Now, I mentioned as well uh, cobalt. Now, cobalt is, you, you may have heard of it. It's, um, Hosted in uh, a variety of different types of deposits, but why you probably will have heard about it is you might have heard of um, child labour in the DRC or Democratic Republic of Congo. You might have heard of coltan. And the coal in that is your cobalt. Um, no, it's not columbite. Sorry, ignore that. That's me doing mineral. Um, it's absolutely not. But it, cobalt is still um, uh, mined out by child labour. Um, in the DRC. So having ethical sources of your minerals is also a really important consideration, um, particularly when we're talking about critical raw materials. Now there are other alternative um, deposit types and locations where you can find it. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, the, the sediment hosted deposits across the Central African Copper Belt, so outside of DRC, but over in Zambia. There's also lots of um, hydrothermal veins and magmatic sulfide deposits around the world. And cobalt is a primary product from the Buas Air Mine in Morocco, which is unusual. Um, so it's actually a primary and then secondary copper rather than the other way around. Now, the other types of deposits are nickel cobalt laterite deposits. And these occur in areas of high tropical weathering. And nickel is your primary product, but cobalt is also produced. And these are, these are very common, particularly um, in Indonesia, the Philippines, uh, that part of the world in the Pacific. And I also mentioned that there are these seafloor nodules and crusts. And so there's been quite a lot of research 
looking at potential resources from the seafloor. Now, the social license to operate to extract things from the seafloor is incredibly difficult to obtain. There's a lot of very strong feelings about it, whether we should or shouldn't be mining seafloors. Um, but um, in terms of uh, our geological knowledge, we know that there are nodules and costs that occur there that could potentially be extracted as sources for, for a variety of metals, including cobalt. So, excuse me, like I said, there's these variety of deposit types. So these nickel cobalt laterites occurring around the equator, um, these sedimentosa deposits in the DRC and Zambia, and then these magmatic deposits. So you can see it's fairly widely distributed. However, 63% is still um, 63% is still being produced by the DRC. And again, we have another bottleneck where the ore gets sent to China for refining. So uh, the control of that stage of the supply chain is very much under the control of China. And so um, the, 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 the other aspect, as I was saying, the kind of dependence on that artisanal small scale mining, um, often using child labor, it makes, makes it very vulnerable to social pressures within the obviously trying to remove child labor, but also just small scale artisanal miners who are, who are just trying to, you know, uh, make, a, make, a, make a living, a subsistence basically from mining. So there is this huge social pressure to kind of stop it or, or um, you, know, it's, you know, try and prevent it from happening because of environmental issues as opposed to helping people who are trying to, to make a living from mining as, as we all are or at least in my, in my industry, we all are. Um, so there is the new supply of cobalt, which will be outside of DRC, but will still probably end up being processed in China. Um, it's subject to developments in nickel and copper markets, because as if uh, nickel prices are very low, um, but cobalt is your byproduct, you might not really be bringing on stream so many new nickel deposits. And so the potential to extract that cobalt is also lost because 90% of cobalt is, is a byproduct basically from these, these various minerals, nickel and copper. And just to go to talk a little more about nickel, um, as we said, many cobalt deposits are also nickel deposits and you get these magmatic um, sulfide deposits and you have hydrothermal nickel deposits, but the major source really are nickel cobalt laterites. And that's where you have mafic and ultra mafic rocks and they've undergone tropical weathering. So places like the Philippines, Indonesia, massive suppliers of nickel. And again, as, as a cobalt, the seafloor nodules and cross also have the potential for nickel. They host similar, similar, um, excuse me, similar minerals. <clears throat> and so, as I said, just where it's produced, you can see that the equator or equatorial regions where you have this very significant tropical weathering and where there are mafic and ultra mafic rocks, you can see that this is um, where you're getting these nickel cobalt or just nickel laterites concentrated there. And again, the magmatic sulfides up here in uh, Canada, Finland and Russia. But um, like I said, Indonesia is, has, uh, controls more than 50% of the world nickel production. And this is really significant because Indonesia actually only last year um, the government said that they no longer wanted to export raw material. They, did, they wanted to do some processing in country in order to increase the revenue from, you know, you're selling a higher value product then. So um, the, like I said, so there's a reliance on the success of these HPAL projects. So HPAL is high pressure acid leaching. That's how they extract um, the nickel. So if these projects in Indonesia fail, then, Indonesia, the government is saying they're still they're still going to wait and they're go, they're going to um, see what happens with the um, production. You know they they don't want to export it um, as a as a kind of a, a bare minimum raw material and they really want to increase the value of their product. So, but these projects, I mean, there's a track record of delays and costs overruns. You know, it's very hard to get these things sorted. Again, you still need your social license to operate from the local community. And so the, um, there's, there's a real risk of that battery grade class of nickel supply tightening um, across the world. Now, alternative, you can make, um, you can make nickel from uh, nickel pig iron. So you can extract the nickel from it. 
but it's very cost prohibited and very emissions intensive. You've got to get to incredibly high temperatures. So you're using enormous amounts, but usually of fossil fuels to get to there in order to extract it. So again, it's kind of that whole, you know, using fossil fuels to get a mineral that will be used in a, a low emission battery is it's it's kind of a bit of a juxtaposition. So we really need to think about the sources of the energy that we're using to get these metals out. Um, there's also quite a lot of environmental concern that's really been growing about the higher CO2 emissions from these, like I say, they're quite energy intensive, these HPAL, HPAL, project, um, HPAL um, processing plants are also quite energy intensive. And then there's also um, a lot of concern about tailing disposal. There is a, an element called chromium, which um, if it's in the three plus form, it's entirely inert and not bioavailable but there's also a uh, a version hex hexavalent so six plus and that is incredibly toxic to humans and that is associated with these nickel deposits so there's a lot of concern about the waste material that's coming out of these and how it's managed um and that is a that is actually a particular area of research at bgs how we deal with these hexavalent chromium um it, from these particular mine wastes and so I've, I've kind of talked quite a lot about the, excuse me, the, the sources of the raw materials for these, um, for these batteries. But what happens to the battery when we're finished with it? And this is just a, a little infographic of the actual um, life cycle of a battery. So you've got, if we start up here, your battery is manufactured. It's all the raw materials from all the different places have been processed into the various components. And then they've been put together into a battery. That battery is, goes into an electric vehicle and um, they kind of have a lifespan of about seven years, depending, depending on, the, on the car and what it's used for, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then you end up with a used battery pack. Now, for this, you have three options. Um, one is junk. Um, this is quite, quite dangerous. I don't know if you remember uh, a recall of phones with lithium ion batteries a few years ago that were called back because they're quite flammable. So you have to be quite careful, particularly if the battery is damaged, they, they could be um, a real hazard, a real risk. And so um, there's um, if they haven't got the kind of proper market structure and the regulation as well is really important here. The policies around disposable, dis disposal of these batteries will be really very important. Now, obviously, we don't really want things to go to junk. And actually, what we what we really want is for them to be more repurposed and recycled. So by repurposing a battery, I mean it can have a second life. So when your car battery um, is deemed to be less efficient, it's still got 80% of its efficiency there, but it's not really efficient enough to run your vehicle. So what they are, what people are doing now, what the research is around, is actually putting the batteries together as a storage pack. So for example, you can run your wind turbines, you can charge up your battery, your huge battery pack, and then um, when there's low wind or when, um, or, or, yeah, for example, or with um, photovoltaics in the nighttime, you can use that um, stored energy instead of depending on your renewables. So it's a way of capturing that energy and keeping it for a time when the renewables either aren't working if it's low wind or it's dark. And so that second life can actually have almost up to 12 years for some aspects, depending on the application that you're using your battery for. You can actually use the battery for a further 12 years. So you're talking almost 20 years out of these batteries. And then if it goes for recycling, then you're talking about, um, you know, almost a, a uh, almost kind of closed cycle in terms of um, raw materials for these batteries. Now, obviously, as we have increasing demand, you're still going to need to manufacture more batteries. But hopefully... Um, we will be able to use these batteries as a storage mechanism and that will really come along and then eventually we will be able to recycle batteries um, and actually extract all the really valuable uh, raw materials that are in there so they don't go to waste. And so what about the UK? Um, I wanted to include this because there is some potential for these critical raw materials in the UK and, and here in Scotland. So in terms of lithium, there's kind of two key areas. I've mentioned Cornish lithium before. They're looking at extracting um, lithium from brines in that from brines and they're they're drilling geothermal holes and looking at the lithium content of the water that they're extracting. And then in Scotland itself, it would be hard rock resources. 
so pegmatites and lithium-rich granites. Now, these occur up in the northeast and they go from Port Troy to Glengarren, so um, approximately here. Um, and these, there's been very little exploration, but the, um, there was a project two years ago called LI for UK, so Lithium for UK, and they did manage to um, take some samples from Glen Bucket and get some lithium out of it, just on a very pilot kind of lab scale. So there is real interest in what's happened or in, in the potential for um, available raw materials in the UK. As I said, that dependency on importation um, makes you makes um, a real risk to your supply. So kind of looking domestically for things is always going to be something that people are really interested in. And if we look at um, nickel and cobalt, um, then there's actually quite significant potential in Scotland, particularly up here in the Huntley and Arthrath areas in northeast Scotland. Um, so this, there was a lot of exploration in the 60s and 70s and 80s. And actually, um, there was a resource, like an informal resource estimate, so it hadn't been kind of signed off by a competent person, um, of, you know, 3 million tonnes of um, nickel at kind of 0.5 weight percent and 17 million tonnes at 0.2 weight percent um, at Arthrath. So there is real potential for um, extraction of nickel um, and excuse me, nickel and um, cobalt actually in that in that particular part of the world. There is ongoing exploration right now. There's exploration happening at the moment. There's drilling um, by Aberdeen Minerals and Aram exploration are both active in the area at the moment. And um, obviously it will still require social license to operate and I mentioned that 16 years again, so you're talking quite a long lead in time for anything, but it is, there's definite potential within Scotland, within the UK and in Scotland, really particularly um, for raw materials for the electric vehicles, for the batteries. Um, and just to, I'm coming towards the end, I promise, uh, the, in terms of the raw material supply chains, exploration is really only the beginning of your supply chain. Most or most mines, they export the materials, they export the concentrates, as I said, for processing and manufacturing. And one of the ways in which we can kind of um, assess the impact of this is we use a life cycle, um, life cycle analysis, so LCA. And that's a lot of work is ongoing, particularly at BGS and with colleagues down in Cambridge School of Mines and at MinViro, um, looking at the actual overall impact, including the carbon footprint, of extracting this and looking at the whole value chain and not just the exploration and mining stages. And this is just an example of why we, we follow it. We really want to know what's happening, but you can see in this particular figure, it just shows that essentially everything flows to China almost um, uh, in terms of uh, the raw materials, which are these colors here. So the lithium carbonate and the lithium concentrate are all going to China. And then everything gets exported out as you know, battery cells or various um, various manufactured products. I've mentioned the um, the social license to operate quite a few times, and um, it is there's some serious issues associated with all sorts of mining. There's environmental concerns, there's social impacts, and there's governance issues. So, including like corruption and things like that. But none of these are the inevitable consequence of mining. There is regulation, there's governance, there's responsible sourcing approaches that are needed. Um, and that is the approach that we really need to take to ensure we're not just absolutely, um, you know, taking everything and walking away from it. But one of the things that I will say is that many of the countries um, where this will be best achieved, where we have excellent regulation and governance and responsible sourcing approaches, would really prefer that the mining didn't happen here. So we probably heard not in my backyard. Um, so this is a real problem uh, in terms of actually mining there. People are happier to allow other countries to take the environmental hit or the social hit for mining and that, and that is a real problem. And if we want to, uh, if we want to address that, you know, we will need to start thinking about um, those kind of the, the, the responsibility for that. So finally, to, to conclude, we're really moving away from fossil fuels and decarbonizing our energy and our transport. We, we're going to need raw materials and they're going to come from a very wide range of deposit types. So that's, that's why geology is essential. We need to understand the mineralogy, the hydrogeology, 
the soil chemistry, the and so really being able to have the data to inform the impact, inform people who are looking at the impact of the mine, and also to just explore and, and, and figure out where these deposits are and how they could be extracted. I've mentioned mineral processing a few times, and that's a real bottleneck for these raw materials. I said you saw that figure, every a lot of things go to China. China has a real dominance in terms of um, that, that, that part of the supply chain and that level of control doesn't look like it's going to change anytime soon. And, you know, there is a real, we need to balance it. We want to reduce our carbon emissions. We want to reduce the fossil fuels. One way of doing that is looking at um, electric vehicles or um, uh, uh, renewable, re renewable energy sources. But to do that, we're going to need raw materials. So you've got to balance this. Um, it's, it's almost an oxymoron needing to extract more in order to not use so much fossil fuels. And then on top of that, you've got to balance local and global environmental concerns. Um, I heard a great quote earlier from one of the COP talks, I think it was the Prime Minister of Barbados. She said, there's no national solution to a global problem. And that kind of comes in terms of raw materials as well. So we've got to really balance these sort of global concerns on, on, on a global basis, but also on a local basis. Okay, and I think that is everything I wanted to say. Apologies if that was a bit longer than you'd hoped. Um, <laughs> no, that's perfectly okay. Uh, you know, that, that, was, that was great. Thank you.